Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church this morning. Let's come on in with the blue hymn book. Let's stand with number 52 to start with. Sorry, can you turn off the two side mics over here for now? Number 52 to start with the blue hymn book. Turn to number 102. 102. Jesus won. 
Jesus, wonderful Lord. Okay, back to number 50. Number 50. this morning and then right after the announcements kids you guys are going to be singing okay all right good morning uh, we had a real good time yesterday other than that being a little cold uh, doing the uh, Christmas caroling and the hayride so uh, we got a little over 75 tracks out so they got some tracks out at the mall and just had a good time singing and enjoyed that and fellowship and uh, we also just got coming up, uh, we have uh, no afternoon service on the 25th, being Christmas, um, so we'll just have the morning, uh, 11 o'clock service that week, and then New Year's Eve, we have the popcorn preaching on New Year's Eve, that'll be uh, at 6 p.m., so starting at 6 p.m., we'll be doing some singing, and then we'll have uh, two to three preachers before seven, and then we're going to have some more uh, preaching and testimonies at 7.45 until kind of get wrapped up there, so try to make it out for that. Um, and then also Miss Tawana needs some uh, uh, helpers with the cleaning schedule. So if anyone can sign up for that, uh, go ahead and, uh, she's not here this morning, but get in touch with her and get on that upcoming list. And then we have the kids special.
was really good. I appreciate hearing that. <laughs> let's, uh, let's stand and do one more before the service this morning. One more before the service. Let's actually go to number 93. Let's sing that one ourselves. That one's a good one. Number 93. sing verses 1 and 3. Let's sing verses 2 and 4, all right? Verses 2 and 4. Start with Christ. Ready? Christ, my highest and adored, Christ the If you would turn to Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. Please do keep people in prayer who are out of town and out sick. Seems to be going around a little bit here and there. <clears throat> if you're here for this afternoon service, uh, finishing up a question and answer we talked about um, snake handling and um, drinking poisonous things last week and we covered the signs of the apostles who the apostles are and when the apostles lived and then we showed how the apostleship died out with the apostle Paul that's very clear from scripture and um, people today in some denominations continue the apostleship um, and then they claim to have the signs that they can't show evidence of. Um, but in that thought, in Matthew chapter or Mark chapter 16, where the question was out of, it says, "He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved; he that believeth not shall be damned." I mean, you've read that verse and wondered about baptism. There's many different religions that believe that baptism is a part of your salvation, and um, it's probably the most common answer I get around here. Uh, have you been saved? Yeah, I got baptized. So we're going to look at baptism in the Bible, and um, I don't just mean what, what uh, water baptism. How many of you know that there are at least seven baptisms in the Bible? At least seven. All right, so we're going to look at those this afternoon. All right, take your Bible, turn to Judges 7. Judges 7. We looked at Gideon last week in Judges chapter 6 and preached on Gideon going through affliction. And sometimes when you preach on something, you have to live with it for the whole next week. So some of you had to go through some sickness this week. Some of you listening online, I'm sure, that are still uh, struggling with sickness and being in pain and all that. Some of you trying to get back in town and make equipment that was made to travel on the road, travel on the road. So glad to have you guys back with us. Uh, we were tracking you every step of the way, so uh, glad you made it back in, and hopefully U-Haul covers all your damages and expenses. Good luck with that. Uh, Judges chapter 7, let's just read a couple verses here. I want to look at Gideon as a leader, and I want to talk about leadership this morning. Leadership is necessary in our homes, and that's probably the place where it starts. <coughs> 
instruction should come from the Bible and from the church and from the pulpit. And if somebody doesn't teach you about leadership, then it's going to be really hard to learn about leadership. Somebody said uh, leadership is uh, rarely taught, but it must be learned. <laughs> and it's hard to explain in a sermon putting this together. I had a great novel. I thought it was a great idea and all these things I was going to put in here. But uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about is just you're going to have to do what the Lord tells you to do and figure out how to do it with the right heart. That's really the summation of the thing. And you could read a lot of books on leadership, which I, I started in my 30s. I probably should have started sooner and find a lot of different people's ideas and thoughts and some things are helpful but I'll tell you what it boils down to is listening to God and having a right heart and Gideon does that pretty well he doesn't do everything right but that's part of being a leader as well let's read uh, Judges chapter 7 and start in verse 1 it says then Jeroboam who is Gideon so remember that he has two names and they'll switch back and forth here um, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mora in the valley. It's hard to tell how far apart they are from the enemy. Some people said a few hundred yards. I don't, I don't believe that. So, uh, one place I read said four miles. But keep in mind, if they're four miles apart and there's thousands of people, tens of thousands of people stretched out, you don't have tens of thousands of people in in. One, one point on your GPS. It takes, they take up um, a huge area. So they're very nearby, the enemy. Verse 2, the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee <coughs> excuse me, are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, <coughs> Mine own hand hath saved me. Don't forget that the Lord is a jealous God. And as soon as you want to take some glory from what the Lord's doing, the Holy Spirit just evaporates. And I've seen it in preachers. I've seen it in people getting up to sing specials. Um, it's a blessing seeing kids sing specials because they don't they don't understand what they're doing. They're just they're just doing it with the right heart for the Lord. And somebody uh, gets up and wants to. They said, "Man, I heard this song sung one time, and it really got everybody excited and amen in and." Maybe down south people were shouting and hollering, so that's the special that I want to sing. And then they get up there and sing the same words. Maybe they get the same piano player to accompany them, and they get up there and sing, and it just falls flat. And I don't know what else to describe it, except they wanted some of that glory to be shared with them, that the Lord said, I deserve the glory, and I want to be glorified in my congregation and in my people, and you're just a vessel, and you can just sit there and please me, or you can try to gather glory to yourself. And if you remember, that's what the devil did. The devil wanted to take that light that he was supposed to reflect back on God. He's the light bearer, the light carrier, if, his, if that's what Lucifer means. And he wanted to take that glory for himself and be exalted above the stars of heaven and make his throne up there with the throne of God. And God doesn't care if it's a special music or if it's the second most powerful being in the universe. He won't have it. He will not have it. He will be exalted and he will be glorified because of who he is. And the Lord says, there's too many people. Get rid of these people. <clears throat> if you guys go out there and fight, you'll get the glory for it. And you guys don't know how to fight anyways. You've been sitting around with your farm tools winnowing wheat. In the I found out that that was done in a basket, by the way. So you take a basket and throw it up in the air, not a shovel. Back in the day, I had to find somebody that sold farm equipment tell me about baskets. But anyways... The Lord says, I don't want you saying that you saved yourselves. Verse 3, Now therefore, <clears throat> go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. That's a 68.8% reduction. And the Lord says, that's a good start. <laughs> He's not done thinning them out yet. <clears throat> now, if you're a leader and a military commander, certainly this would make you a little bit nervous. But the Lord continues in verse 4, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are yet too many. Ten thousands way too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water. 
I don't know how many people can come to the water at the same time, but certainly not 10,000 people. So somehow they're flowing through here in a line or maybe a couple hundred at a time. And as they're down by the water, Gideon's walking along the banks of the other side and picking them out and saying, all right, you stand aside, you stand aside, the rest of you go home. And then another wave of people comes up to get a drink. And Gideon says, you come on ahead, you come on ahead, you stand over there, the rest of you go home. <clears throat> so Gideon's watching all this, and the Lord's telling him who to pick. Verse 5, so he brought down the people into the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Now, this has to be explained at least one time, because if you read it through about four times, you figure it out. All right, so I'll just make it easy for you. If you lap the water with a dog like your tongue, what he's talking about, and he'll say it in a minute, is licking the water out of your hand. So you scoop it up. This is what I do every time I brush my teeth. Nobody can keep track of a cup on the sink in our house. So I gave up a long time ago, and I just lap it like I just slurp it <laughs> out of my hand and finish, finish rinsing out my mouth. But anyways, that's the lapping like a dog, okay? So they're pulling their hand. They're cupping their hand, maybe both hands, to their face, and they've got one knee on the ground, <clears throat> and or they're bending over all the way, and then they're cupping that water and lapping it out of their hand. That's as a dog lappeth. You'll see that in a minute. Verse 5, middle of the verse, Likewise, <coughs> everyone that <coughs> boweth down upon his knees to drink. So that's a different thing. Those people are going up to the water, and, and they're on both knees, plural, and they're sticking their whole face down into the water, and then drinking the water that way. Verse 6, And the number of them that lapped, look at the next phrase, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. Now, there's one good guess on why the Lord did it this way, and there's plenty of other guesses and unknown speculations in this passage. And the only guess that makes any sense, and this is still just a guess, is that the people that bowed down and put their faces to the water didn't care about their surroundings. Now, if you're going to be in any kind of um, oh, troublous situation, <clears throat> you ought to be aware I'm trying to teach my daughters this because they find themselves going, as soon as you get a kid with a car, man, it's like, go get us milk. We forgot butter. Uh, we just need one loaf of bread. And then you think about it later as a parent, like, I'm sending my kid into Billings. I'm sending my kid into the world. I'm sending them into this place where people get stabbed regularly, where there's shootings every week, where there's shooting sometimes every day of the week or an average of once a day of the week, which is incredible to me because I don't really see that going on, but I see the reports of that going on. And then I'm sending my daughter into the middle of this. So I teach them to be aware and f preach to everybody about carrying knives and pepper spray and all that stuff. I hope some of you listened. I hope you got a lot of them in the stockings right now for everybody you know. <coughs> all right. <coughs> But one thing they teach you in defense awareness is that there's four levels, and this is there's everybody has their different takes on it. But there's level um, white, and then yellow, and then orange, and then red. And the level white is where most people are sitting in their typical uh, setting. It's not paying attention to anything. You might as well be asleep. Doesn't matter if you're walking down the street or in the store or in your car. Most people are at level white, completely unaware of their surroundings. And it's a dangerous place to live. It's a very blissful place to live, but they say if ignorance is bliss, some of you are living in a blizzard and not a very <laughs> safe place to live. And then the next condition they call condition yellow. <clears throat> and in condition yellow, you're aware of everything going on around you as best you can be. And you should stay in condition yellow anytime you open the front door of your house. <laughs> You should be aware, if you live on a street, that there's not somebody standing outside your door and surprising you. How many of you have ever had that happen? A stranger standing right outside, I don't know, maybe that door there or at your house, and then you are all of a sudden made aware of this thing. Well, that's too late to make a plan. So yellow is you're aware of everything. And orange is your, um, you see something that might be a potential danger and you're formulating a plan. And if you laser over in the parking lot and have somebody... Uh, 
suspicious following you to your car and then you take a zig and then you take a zag and they zig when you zig instead of zagging when you zig and you get the suspicion that this person might not be heading to their own car you should immediately have a plan here's here's all your plan needs to be hey can I help you that's all you're gonna say are you in trouble over there just like when you go over to the other team's table and the Thanksgiving thing and Kurt says, can I help you? Over th like, that's the thing that should be coming out of your mouth. There's nothing, there's nothing offensive there. You're not going on the offense. You're not pulling out flamethrowers or anything. You're just saying, hey, I'm recognizing that you're there and I'd like to draw some attention to this situation. That's a good plan. And if you have a better plan, you should maybe carry that plan out three or four steps if you need to in your head. And then condition uh, red is executing that plan. And that's going all out to get out of there or to address it. That would be white, yellow, orange, and red. You should live in the state of yellow. I don't know. I mean, you should just stay there. That's not living in fear. That's being aware. And the best that you can figure what these men are doing here down by this river is that the men that just put their faces down to the water and they're laying flat on their belly have made the thirst their most important thing in that moment. And the Lord says, I'm not interested in a man who puts his thirst ahead of me when there's an enemy four miles or less just on the other side of the hill. How do you know you're not going to be attacked at any second? And you're just going to suck up that water and keep your face down there for a minute because you haven't had any water for all day because it's hot outside? There's some things more important in life than getting water every couple hours. So the men that put, put, took one knee and uh, lapped up the water, the Lord says, those are the men that I want to be the next leaders with you. And these three men end up, uh, 300 men end up leading. I mean, they're not leading anybody at first because they're carrying a pitcher and a trumpet, but these men end up being the leaders that go with Gideon. <clears throat> and the Lord says, I'm going to deliver you by these men. What does a leader do? <coughs> Number one, a leader listens to God's orders. You say, what leadership book did you get that out of? None of them. I've probably got 10 to 20 of them in my office and scanned a few here and there in libraries or bookstores over the years. None of them. I've read leaders that say, you ought to make sure that you follow the Washington Post principle. What's the Washington Post principle? That anything I do in this naval capacity aboard this ship, if it were to be reported in the Washington Post, I wouldn't be ashamed. That sounds good at first. It sounds like a good ideal to live by, except do you know who the Washington Post is and what they represent? Everything the Bible doesn't. <laughs> I've read that you need to be a vision caster. You need to get a vision. <clears throat> you need to tell the vision. You need to repeat the vision. You need to get people excited about the vision. And then you need to get people to implement the vision and get people glad to do it. And never mention where you're supposed to get this vision from. A pastor, a former pastor that wrote that book. His name's John Maxwell. I believe he's saved. I found his testimony in one of his books, so I'll, I'll give him that he's saved. He's a pastor. He's a great speaker. He wrote a lot of leadership books, and a lot of the things he says are, are good, and I have cards of, full of stuff that he said that I think are good and that you should uh, do in your life and get some common sense things, except for his vision casting statements. I've read a lot of different things about leadership, and everybody leaves out this thing right here, and some of you leave it out in your lives. <clears throat> you think, I'm a father in my home, and so I'm just going to do what dads are supposed to do. And where do you get the idea of what you're supposed to do from? I'm a mother, and my calling is to my children. And where do you get your instructions on how to take care of your home and how to raise your children and how to treat your husband when he's a jerk and when he's not a jerk? What are you supposed to do? See, I'm supposed to read books on mothering and get magazines on parenting and get all these ideas from the world on all these culturally acceptable things and take all these influences from the Disney movies and from the kids' shows on TV, and that's how you're going to run your family. You're going to wreck it. You're going to run it into the ground. If you are going to be a good leader, I know that you didn't go to a, um, <clears throat> to a motivational um, speech this morning, so you are expecting to hear something from the Bible, but I can't draw enough uh, emphasis to this. A leader must listen to God's orders. 
And everything you see in Gideon's life begins with that, and he, come, he carries through with that towards the end of his life, and he kind of falters at the end. We'll look at that in a minute. But look in Judges 6 and verse 12. Judges 6 and verse 12. <coughs> it says, The angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, <coughs> thou mighty man of valor. And the Lord tells him in the continuing verses, Verse 16, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And then he continues to give him his instructions all the way through the passage. And do you know what Gideon does when he tells him to go destroy that idol? Gideon says, Okay. All right, Lord, I'll go destroy that idol in the middle of the night. Scared as completely as I could be. Gets ten men to go with him, and he, but he does it. Do you know what he does after this? God, can I put out a fleece? God, can I put out another fleece? God, I'm a little bit scared to go down there. It's time to go, Gideon. It's time to go right now in the middle of the night, chapter 7. In the middle of the night, it's time to go. Gideon says, I'm still scared. And the Lord says, if you're still scared, then go send down a messenger. And the messenger hears about the dream. The barley loaf comes flying out of the air in a man's dream. And crushes a tent. And the man's telling the dream to another man in the tent. And Gideon's men are listening outside. And the man interprets the dream and says, Surely this is nothing save the sword of the Lord. And this is Gideon's men. And then he comes back and Gideon says, Okay, I'm good to go to battle now. You know what I've found in my own Christian life? I'll bet you found it in yours. That at the beginning it's really easy to listen to the Lord. The Lord brings you the truth somehow. You get under conviction about it. You fight it for a while. And then you come to the place of repentance and you say, Lord, I am wrong and you are right and I need to get saved. And then the Lord says, here's what I want you to do. Get in a good church. The Lord says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to quit this nonsense. I want you to get your family on track. I want you to, whatever it is for you. And you say, yeah, Lord, obviously I should do that. And you do that. And then the Lord comes to you with the next thing. And the Lord says, I want you to take the next step in your Christian life. And you say, I need a sign for that. (laughs) You you want me to be faithful to lead a ministry in the church? I'm going to have to pray about that. The pastor trusted me with this responsibility and thought me able and competent to do this thing. I don't know. (laughs) Setting up tables maybe, but getting there 15 minutes early. I don't know about all that. (laughs) Uh, you know what happens in the Christian life? The Lord calls you to do something, and He's still talking to you. And everybody's in a leadership position. And the Lord wants you to do something for Him. And then as you get older in life, you know more things that could go wrong. You didn't realize all the things that could go wrong when you were 18, right? You're like, I want to go to Bible school, and I want to leave home anyways. This is a win-win. Let's get out of here, <laughs> right? And then you get down to school, and you're still single after three years, and you're like, take off across the country to somewhere I've never been and don't know anybody? Great. Sounds like a good idea to me. What's in Alaska? <laughs> What's in Billings, Montana? What's in the middle of Nebraska or somewhere, you know? <laughs> well, let's go find out. And then you get married, and you get one or two or three kids, and move across the country to a place where I don't know anybody. I'm going to drag my feet on this one for a couple months. A couple months turns into a year and a half. Your preacher has to come to you and say, is the Lord trying to tell you something? Has the Lord been trying to tell you something so long that he's starting to tell me something about what you should be doing? You know what you're going to have to do if you're going to be useful to the Lord? You're going to have to listen to God's orders. Somebody said in leadership, <clears throat> the mountains of worldly honor are covered in a perpetual snow. That just means that you can't live on the mountaintop. But I kind of think that saying has got some flaws. Somebody else said it a different way, sarcastically or cynically. They say in leadership, it's lonely at the top. <laughs> if you think it's lonely at the top, you don't even understand what a leader is. You know that man in Matthew 8, Jesus came to him and his son, he came to Jesus and his son needed healed and he said, Lord, I'm a man under authority having soldiers under me. And I read that in my Bible and thought, why does it say, is that, is that 
written correctly, I am a man under authority. And I checked the cross-reference in Mark, or Luke, I think it is, Matthew and Luke. And it says the same thing. I am a man under authority, having, author having soldiers under me. How does, that, how does that make any sense? This man is a captain of a bunch of soldiers that work for him, and he has soldiers under him, so he should have said, I'm a man in authority, right, right, like over these soldiers, and I have soldiers under me. And he didn't say that because he understood leadership. And if you understand leadership, you understand that no matter how high you get, you're a man under authority. You think, I mean, I hate using the president for an example. He's a, such a poor example. Pick a good president. Put that president in your mind, okay, if there are any such things. And, uh, I mean, at least Reagan was a good actor. Remember those days, the good old Reagan days? At least the guy knew how to speak and give a good lecture and studied for his <coughs> speeches. But, anyways, go, you got to go back before him to find even a guy that stood for something. But even if you're uh, the president of the United States, you know that you're a man under authority, having people under you. You think, well, who, who are you accountable to? You're the preacher of the church. I'd like to be the preacher and tell everybody what to do. That's the, that, that just tells that you don't understand the first thing about leadership. Um, a good leader doesn't desire to boss people around. A good leader desires to please the Lord. A good des leader desires to please those that are in authority over him, even if he's not saved and doesn't care about the Bible. He cares about doing his job for the sake of the whole of the thing that he represents. I listened to an e economist yesterday, and uh, this uh, world economist gives advice to people that don't listen to him all over the world. <coughs> he said, when I went to these <coughs> world economic forums and they asked me for advice, he said, I was real excited that they called me. Look at who I'm sitting with, these leaders of the nations, these leaders all over the world. And then I find out they give me 15 minutes to speak. And after I speak for 15 minutes and tell them everything's wrong with their economy and how they can fix it, they say, all right, next. And they dismiss you off the stage. And then they come to the end of their <coughs> forum. And he said, this is what I found happens at every one of those. They already had their mind made up before they went into the forum what they needed. And they just need some experts to testify so that they can say that they heard an expert. And then they make the decision that they were going to make before anyhow. So the other problem with our economy, he was um, talking about the United States having a republic. He said the problem with the republic is that everybody can be bribed. The problem with the republic is that politicians think in the short term what will get me elected again instead of thinking in the long term what's good for this country. And why should they think any differently if you're paying them to do that? You're paying them to be in that position. Now, he didn't have any good biblical conclusions because he's a lost economist, but the only answer that you've heard from me many times is a righteous king in authority. A righteous king in authority will keep his position, even though he's the highest person in the land, he'll keep his position in subjection to the Lord. Now, when you're the head of your home, you're kind of the guy at the top. The government's not coming in telling you how to run your home yet. A pastor isn't coming to your house if you have a good pastor and telling you how to uh, fix everything in your house. You're kind of the head of that home, but if you're not under another authority, you're, um, you're just uh, lonely at the top. <laughs> if you think you're the only guy and you're at the top, you have a narcissistic personality disorder. They call that a messiah complex. And some of you have had to work for people like that in the corporate world. They think that nobody else can tell them what to do, and they uh, abuse their authority in other people. <clears throat> but kids, can I say something to you? Right now you have your parents in authority over you. And I know that some of you think, man, I'm tired of this. I don't want to hear what they have to say every time that they tell me something to do because I really hate taking out that stinky compost bucket. Can I get an amen from Hannah and Elijah? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, because the compost bucket goes with the trash, and they have to take both out at the same time. And one day, you're going to be a parent, maybe, probably, possibly. Hannah's eyes are glowing. Elijah's are glazed over. All right. <laughs> <coughs> and one day when you're a parent, you won't have anybody telling you what to do, huh? That's not how it works. You get grown up in life, and then you find out there's more and more and more people telling you what to do. You get to be a parent, and then you have a boss telling you what to do. You find out that there's a Mr. FICA telling you what to do. Every time you get a paper and think that it has a bunch of money, that a bunch of it's gone before you even got to see it. <laughs> If you're a parent, you find out that you have a husband and a wife telling you what to do. 
I mean, a wife has to listen to her husband, and a husband has to listen to his wife and God. Like, this whole thing is just, I need a joke card. My wife got it. <laughs> you can follow a semi down the road, and it says, be your own boss. There's a guy that does not understand leadership. No. <laughs> doesn't understand authority, doesn't even know what he's doing. Be your own boss? You mean have hundreds of customers telling you what to do? You're going to own a business and then think that you're at the top of the thing? Now you just have more bosses than you've ever had before. At least if you work at McDonald's, you can point your finger at the boss. <laughs> you can say, I know, you're my boss. And if I had a club, I know right where to apply it. <clears throat> you know what a good leader does? A good leader understands that he's under authority. He's going to have to learn to listen to God. You know, the world mocks that and laughs at that. People say, God told me to do this, and people say some crazy things God told them to do, and it kind of gives the Lord a bad name when he does speak to Christians. And he does lead in people's lives. <clears throat> a bunch of Christians that understand and know God and seek his face daily it makes sense to them. It makes sense to them to listen to God, even though God doesn't seem to make sense. The Lord says you got too many people. Get rid of them. And Gideon has the right response. <clears throat> In verse 15, Judges 7, 15. And so it was, 7, 15, and it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. <clears throat> I don't care if he did put out the fleece once and then second-guessed himself and had to hear a dream from the enemy. I don't care if he did have to go through all those things to know for sure that it was God speaking to him because of his fear and because of his insecurity. I'm glad that Gideon listened and he did the right thing eventually. And as Christians, there's a bunch of leaders in this room. Some of you don't maybe realize it or don't realize what the Lord's calling you and leading you to do. But the Lord's put you in a position of leadership. <coughs> and the Lord has got something for you coming up in the future. And if you'll listen to the Lord, you'll find out what it is, and you'll be able to do that for Him. And you'll be able to serve Him faithfully. Look in chapter 7 again, and look at verse 16. And I thought this was interesting about the vision casting thought. In verse seven sixteen, it says he divided the 300 men into into three companies and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers and you have to assume that the Lord told him to do this it doesn't say verse 17 he said to them look on me and do likewise and behold when I come to the outside of the camp it shall be that as I do so shall ye do when I blow with the trumpet and all that are with me then blow ye trumpets on every side of all the camp and say look at what they say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon now, where did he get his inspiration for that saying? Look in verse 14. The fellow answered and said, This, this bread flying out of the sky in the dream, that was in 13, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. You know where Gideon got his inspiration, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon? He got it from a lost man interpreting another lost man's dream. What do you do with that? What do you do with those situations in life where there's just no way around explaining it to somebody else? I had a boss ask me one time. I told him I was quitting and moving to Montana. <clears throat> I think I gave him like two months notice or something and just told him my plans. And so everybody on the job site, you know, hears about it. And then the, the white hats, we were the red hats because we were the laborers. So the white hats came to us and came to me, a couple of them. And, oh, I hear you moved to Montana. What's in Montana? Do you know somebody there? No, sir, I don't know anybody there. How you go to, how'd you know to go to Montana? I just believe that's where the Lord had me to go. And my boss, he's a little more sarcastic, concrete finisher. He comes to me and he says, so I hear you're... Moved to Montana to start a church. I didn't say anything about starting a church. <laughs> he said, I hear you moving to Montana to start a church. What did you do? 
drive through and see a pretty mountain or something and hear God call you? And I was like, yeah, that actually is pretty much, in your words at least, the way it actually happened. Yes, I did come through um, Busby or Ashland. And you got those little pink hills off to the side, and you know where those are. And it's about, I don't know, I remember driving all through the night, and the sun was coming up, so it had to be 5 a.m., maybe 6 a.m. I pulled over, and I had, I had a Pop-Tart on my mind. I was going <laughs> to eat a Pop-Tart and read my Bible. That's what I had planned for breakfast that morning. And these wooden fence posts just fascinated me. I'm from Ohio, and I lived down south for a little while. They don't have wooden fence posts. They would rot out of the ground in, like, a a week <laughs> and there's wooden fence posts and I thought those are amazing I'm going to go sit on a wooden fence post watch the sunrise read my bible and eat a pop tart like <laughs> what what could be better than that <laughs> in the middle <laughs> so that's what I did and uh, look at this mountain and I remember in my in my mind this mountain is huge it's like bigger than the earth and the the grass like the the dark green grass you know in front of me like goes into the sage grass color grass and up the hill it turns darker green again and then turns into a greenish brown and then the golden brown as it goes up the mountain and then the reddish hills and then the gray at the top and this mountain was just like in my mind it was massive i went back eight years later drove my motorcycle out there and found the place i was like I drove past it because I didn't, I was like, this can't be it. And I came back, it's this tiny little hill you could walk up in like a day. Like this little pink hill, a thousand feet tall, or not even that much maybe. But I grew up in Ohio. There's no mountains there. <coughs> in Florida, they, they got sand and beaches, but no mountains. It was a pretty impressive sight to me. And I read my Bible that day and skipped back a couple pages and prayed and asked the Lord to show me something if I should be here. And the Lord confirmed it. My boss comes up to me out of the blue, and of all the things he could have said, what would you do, see some mountain and decide to move there? That was like a, one of the strangest confirmations the Lord ever gave me in my life. It was, I don't know what possessed you to say that, except the Spirit of the Lord to say something that would encourage me. It was exactly what the Lord did in my life. You know what Gideon does? He goes here in the confidence and the strength of the Lord, and he doesn't have much of his own strength because it doesn't make any sense to him. He's already gotten rid of all his men, and his battle plan is to get pitchers, water pitchers made out of clay, put a candle in the bottom of them, and sling a trumpet on his side. And then say things about swords that they don't even mention that they have. I assume they had swords, but I can't even prove that they have them. <laughs> I assume anybody in battle would have a sword. Doesn't even tell you if they do. We're going to shout out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon while we're carrying these pitchers and trumpets and lamps. Now, they surround the whole enemy there, and what does the enemy see? Well, in the middle of the night, they hear a crash, and they say 300 lights. Of course, they probably can't count them all surrounding them. And what do they imagine in their mind? They imagine whatever the Lord has them imagine. When you skip out on the vision casting and getting your own ideas and ambitions and goals and programs, and you get on the Lord's timetable and get on the Lord's schedule and get on the Lord's program, then the Lord will set up in other people's minds what is right for him to set up, and he gives them the idea that they are surrounded and each lamp represents thousands of people, at a minimum 2,000 people. All these men would represent the head of a company, or these three men are companies, they'd probably represent uh, a regiment each, and that would be a minimum of 2,000 men. Now the Lord just took a little jar and a little light inside that jar, and a little noise and he took those three minuscule things and he magnified them exponentially to where one person in the enemy's mind was 2,000 people that are ready to kill them times 300 and the enemy gets overwhelmed they don't even know what to do you know in your dealings in your Christian life you are just one individual and it doesn't make very much difference in this world I mean, what are you going to do? Get on Facebook and straighten out every false doctrine in the world? <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to go out and <clears throat> door knock all the doors and buildings by yourself and see thousands of people saved? No, not by yourself. You're not. What are you going to do? You're going to sit at home and randomly call through the phone book and call random numbers and witness to people when you find somebody that'll listen? 
I mean, that would actually be a good thing to do if somebody is stuck at home. But what difference are you going to make without the Lord? I mean, these are all things that people do. These are all programs that people put together. It doesn't matter if it's a nursing home ministry or a jail ministry. It doesn't matter if it's some program that the church has been doing for hundreds of years, their bus ministry or their um, plays and pageants and inviting people out for double the church Sunday and bring five friends Sunday or walk an elephant down the aisle and wheelbarrow an elephant pile of poop out the aisle. It doesn't matter what you're going to do. <clears throat> you're not going to make a difference by yourself unless you get the Lord involved. But the people, the, you've heard it said before, you and the Lord make a majority. And that's quite an understatement. You and the Lord are an exponential majority. But you have to follow what the Lord's doing and not try to get him to follow what you're doing. You know what you are? The Bible calls you just a vessel of clay. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And inside of you, you have a light shining. It's the Spirit of God. And the Lord uses His Spirit to shine a light inside of you. And the first thing that that light does is it searches the inward parts. The Spirit of the Lord, the, the, the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. He searcheth all the inward parts of the belly. The Lord's using that candle to look inside of you and see what's going on inside of that vessel where nobody else looks. Who looks inside of a vessel? You ever go to a pottery store and then look inside the vessels? No, you look at the shelf and find the one that's prettiest on the outside. You know what the Lord's looking at? The Lord's putting a light down inside and a mirror, and he's looking around there, and he's trying to find out what's going on inside, because the inside's what I care about. You can whiten the outside of your sepulcher, and it'll just be a whited sepulcher full of dead men's bones, full of who knows what inside of there. And the Lord says, I want to search the inside, and I want it to be empty and clean and ready for me to use. And then the Lord does the most the most nonsensical thing that you could imagine. The Lord says, okay, I got a clean vessel ready to be used for me. Yes, Lord, I'm ready to be used for you. Okay, um, here's what I want you to do. Take that vessel and drop it on the ground so that it breaks. What? God, I spent a lot of time getting this thing clean and looking good and all that time on the potter's wheel where you were working me and putting you know, all these different finishing touches on me and then you want to drop it on the ground and break it. Lord says, yeah, I can't use you unless you're broken. Lord, you can't use me unless I'm not broken. I'm a vessel. I'm supposed to hold liquid. Lord says, I never said that. <laughs> I said, put a candle inside. And I said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. See, you got so much things filled up in your vessel trying to hold on to things that the Lord says, I want you to let go. If I want you to drop the whole thing completely. So when you drop the vessel, and the vessel breaks, and the light shines forth, and the Lord says, okay, now I can work. Now you want to do something? You want to get involved? Well, I thought I did. I don't know. Do I not want to now? I don't know anymore. Lord, I'm, now I'm confused. Well, good. That's a good place for you to be if you're humble about it. That's a good place for you to be when you don't know what's going on, just to be humble. Why don't you take up that trumpet, and why don't you play a tune for me? Why don't you sound an alarm call? Here's the exact thing that I want you to play. Why don't you lift up your voice like a trumpet and cry aloud and spare not? Can I play like a real fancy tune from Haydn's trumpet concerto in E? No. No, I want you to play an awful sounding shofar. Have you ever heard that awful sounding horn thing they play in Israel? It's like the most unnatural, irritating sound. I hope that's not the rapture trumpet sound, but it might be. All the Pentecostals say it is. I don't know if they're right. I want you to take this ugly, obnoxious-sounding trumpet, and I want you to play an alarm sound for me. I want to play something that people are impressed with. And the Lord says, no, I don't want that. I want you to blow an alarm. Lord, do you really want me to go up to a guy and say, here's something to keep you out of hell? Yeah, that's what I want you to say. God, can I, can I just say... Let Christ into your life. No, that's not what I'm asking you to say. <laughs> Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. I want you to say, judgment is coming. The Lord is mad. And he's coming back in anger and in fire and in wrath unless you get on his side. That's what I want you to say. God, that does not sound very aesthetically pleasing to the ear. 
it says, well, you're kind of wrong about the, <coughs> about the vessel. Maybe you're wrong about the trumpet, too. If you let that vessel be broken for the Lord, and quit hiding your light under a bushel or inside the vessel, and let it shine before men, they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And if you lift up your voice and say the awkward things, you get opportunity every time it's holiday season to speak up for the Lord. And you don't have to say some horrible, mean, nasty, fundamentalist thing. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you speaking up and saying, the Lord loved you and the Lord died for you so that he could save you from hell. I mean, you know your family. You know your friends. Some of you have way more wisdom than I do. You could say in five words what would take me three sentences to say. Some of the little kids will put you to shame. Grandpa, are you ever going to get saved? Seven words. That was what my uh, history, high school history teacher's daughter said to his father. You know what? He ended up getting saved. That was kind of the beginning of it. <clears throat> that wasn't an amazing concerto. That was just a lowly trumpet blast. Every man stood in his place round about the camp, and all the hosts ran and cried and fled, and the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. You know, when you lead under the Lord's leading, and the Lord gets involved in his own program, and everybody fled, and Gideon follows up the thing and finishes them off. Gideon listens to the Lord. Gideon leads by example. And Gideon has inconsistencies, and he has his own faults. <coughs> I want to say a couple things about his faults, and then I'll finish up. Look in chapter 7 again. Look at chapter two, uh, chapter 7, verse 2. The Lord says there's too many people. <coughs> there's too many people, and I want you to get rid of some of them. So tell everybody in verse 3, proclaiming there's a people, whosoever is fearful and afraid. You can write down in your side reference Deuteronomy 20 and verse 8. <coughs> Deuteronomy 20 and verse 8. Whosoever is fearful and afraid, you're supposed to leave battle anyways. But Gideon might not have known that scripture, so the Lord gave it to him. And they returned. The Lord doesn't have any place for fearfulness on the battlefield. But look at verse 10. They say cowardice is epidemic. As soon as one person starts running, other people will follow him. <clears throat> so you've got to get rid of the fearful. General Patton said, you have to talk about death with your soldiers and teach them about how to remain confident and bold in battle. Judges 7, verse 9, it came to pass the same night the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down to the host, for I have delivered into thy hand. Verse 10, but if thou fear to go down. You know who should have gone back? Gideon should have gone back and gone home, but he didn't. Why didn't he? Well, the Lord didn't say, I'm going to take every person who is fearful and send them home. <clears throat> he said, I want everybody who admits that they're fearful to go home. You know, the difference between a fearful man and a man that goes forward with boldness and courage. <laughs> the man with courage just goes forward anyways. That's the only difference. If you weren't afraid, it wouldn't be courage. The man says, I know it's more important for me to stay here, and I may have some fear, but I don't have enough fear to go home, so I'm staying. Gideon has a little bit of inconsistency there, and the Lord deals with his inconsistency with no problems at all. In chapter 6 and verse 33, look at Gideon's confidence. 6.33, all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together, went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel, and then Gideon blows a trumpet in verse 34. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. He sent messengers that we're going to go clean up the enemy. He's got a lot of confidence. And then in verse 36, Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor. What happened to his confidence? <clears throat> a little inconsistent, isn't he? 
into chapter 8. Judges 8. <clears throat> Judges 8, verse 24. Gideon defeats all the enemy. He gets the spoils of war. And then in verse 24, we don't really know why he did this, but it looks like he changed his mind. He already got some gold, and he already got some camel, some, some ornaments from the camel's necks. That would have been quite a chunk of gold from the Midianites and the Ishmaelites. Verse 24 are there. Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Gideon has some inconsistencies, and Gideon has some faults. How come Gideon needed some more gold when he already had gold? <clears throat> Verse 27, Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah, and all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare to all the people in the city, yeah, and to Gideon, and to his house. Don't you ever read through the Bible and you're really starting to admire a guy? And then you get to the end of his life. You read through Job and you're like, this guy's really going through it, man. And standing up to it and saying the right things pretty much. I mean, considering the circumstances, he's really, really holding the course in spite of everything, including the devil himself after him. Like, man, I really admired Job. And then you get to chapter 32, and God starts talking. And uh, um, Elihu starts talking and says, Job was righteous in his own eyes. And you're like, ah. Read the life of David, and you're like, man, David is the man. He deals with Saul, who's crazy, figures out a way to skirt around him every time, figures out a way to just get out of it at the last second. He's on the run half the time. He, then he's making up, being friends again. And then he's on the run again. And he's, he's never going to die because he got anointed to be king. We know he's going to be king. And then he hit 2 Samuel 11 or 13, whatever it is, and, he, and he's with Bathsheba. And you're like, I really had my hopes up for this guy. And you look at Solomon getting going. And you're like, Solomon's the wisest man on earth. What could possibly go wrong? Everything. <laughs> Everything could possibly go wrong. And then you read Gideon, and you're like, this guy listens to the Lord, struggles through fear, takes over the enemy, has a following, which none of the other judges do very well. Gideon does the best at it. And then he gets to the end, and he goes back to idolatry and causes other people to go to idolatry. <clears throat> you know what Jesus said about men? You need to memorize this as much as you need to memorize John 3.16. As much as you need to memorize, you must be born again in the same chapter of John. You need to back up one verse into chapter 2, verse 25. Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. You know what you need to remember? Not to commit yourself unto men. You know, a leader is responsible for the things that he's responsible for, and that's it. The leader's not responsible for him usurping his authority and getting outside from under his own authority. God uses men, and God uses men in leadership positions, and God uses men with faults. And then finally, a good leader leaves a good legacy for the next generation. Look in Judges chapter 8 again. <coughs> we'll finish with this. Judges 8, <coughs> verse 28. Peter's not just concerned about today. He's not just concerned about his term in office. He's concerned about the next generation. Judges 8, 28, Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more, and the country was in quietness forty years in the days of Gideon. <clears throat> you say, what else could Gideon do? I, there's probably a lot more he could have done. I wish he would have set it up a little bit better for the time following his day. I wish he wouldn't have gone into idolatry. I wish you wouldn't have taken a bunch of wives. The Lord didn't have to tell you this, but Jeroboam, the son of Joash, that's Gideon, verse 29, went and dwelt in his own house, and Gideon had three score and ten sons, seventy kids, seventy sons of his own body, of his, begot, of his body begotten, for he had 
many wives. And you find out he has a son, Abimelech, from, that's going to be in the next chapter. I wish Gideon hadn't done that. <clears throat> was Gideon a good leader? In spite of his faults? Was the Lord pleased with Gideon? Hebrews chapter 11 tells you that he was. Of all the people mentioned in Hebrews 11, you can't list everybody in the Bible. Gideon makes the list. What more can I say, for time would fail me, to tell of Gideon and of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah? Those guys did some terrible things. And the Lord says, I'm really pleased with those guys. Of all the things they could have done, they did some things right that were pleasing to me. <clears throat> what happens in the next generation? Well, each generation <clears throat> is accountable to their own decisions. Verse 33, as soon as it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth their God. The children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hands of the enemies on every side, neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. That tells you that Gideon did do the right things to set it up for the generation, and it still didn't last. You know what I know from the Lord just from reading through the book of Judges? We get these little highlights that the Lord came to <coughs> Deborah and came to Barak came to Samson's parents and Samson and came to Gideon. We get these little highlights of where the Lord spoke to people, but you know what I know about the Lord? He approached and spoke to many people. He gave everybody an opportunity. How many four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds during the time of the judges did the Lord come to them and say, I have a mission for you. I want you to do something for me. I want you to go in that kitchen and I want you to smash that idol in your parents' house. Just like he did to Gideon. Gideon was a little older. I want you to take ten men and go smash that idol that's out there in front of your dad's property. And those kids said, I could never do that. And the Lord said, no, I could. you could do that and that's why I asked you. I want you to stand up <clears throat> with a little Bible and I want you to tell your friends that you love Jesus. You say, I could never do that. You could do that. If the Lord asked you to do it, you could do it. I want you to speak to your grandparents. I want you to tell them about Jesus. I don't want you to pester them. I don't want you to nag them. I don't want you to tell them 50 times in one week. That would be rude and inconsiderate, and that wouldn't be spiritual. I want you to live a clean and holy life so that when people see the trouble that you're going through and they see that you still love God, that they'll have to reckon with me someday over that. <clears throat> You say, I could never do that, this thing that the Lord wants me to clean up or this thing he wants me to do or start doing or stop doing. I could never do that. I was reading through some old notes yesterday when I used to preach at the Juvenile Delinquent Center. And one of the kids said, I can't do all those things God wants me to do in the Bible. <laughs> all those things he's telling me to do and I'm reading about, I can't do all those things. I just quit reading it. I put it up. <laughs> I wish that people in church were so honest some of you read through the Bible and say I can't do all those things I can't understand that whole thing you know you don't have to understand the whole Bible you just need to do the one thing that the Lord showed you to do today I found an old note from my preacher and uh, a visiting preacher in my Bible and he said find one verse every day in the Bible and live that verse well that's that's doable that's attainable Read until the Lord gives you one verse and then do that. See, I could never do that thing. <clears throat> How many thousands and thousands and thousands of people did the Lord go to in the time of the book of Judges? And so I want you to stand up for me against everybody else. And I want you to do this for me. And they said, nope, no can do. Nope, try the next guy. Never going to happen for me. And the Lord said, okay, I'll move on. And he'll move on, and he'll move on, and he'll move on until he'll find one that will do something for him. Now, if you're in church this morning, I kind of take it for granted that you want to do what the Lord wants you to do. And I don't claim to have these uh, life-changing sermons every week. I don't claim to have these giant goals and aspirations. I have some ideas, and I try to be faithful every day to what the Lord's doing today. But I think the Lord's leading people in 
different things in this church and different directions and maybe ministries in this church. And if you'll listen to him today and the little things that he leads you to do, you'll be able to lead a great army. You'll be able to lead your home. You'll be able to lead somebody else to the Lord. You'll be able to lead some people in a Bible study. You'll be able to lead some people in a <coughs> in an event or a missionary campaign or I, I don't know. I don't know what the Lord's doing in individuals' lives, but I know He's speaking to people. You need to be willing to hear from Him no matter how crazy the world thinks it is. All right, Lord, I ask that you would please bless the words of this message this morning. I ask you please help us to get some inspiration from Gideon, from the things that he did right. Lord, I ask that you would please uh, help people here this morning to hear from you. Lord, I'm not trying to put some tall order on anybody that is impossible to fulfill. Lord, I ask that you'd help them to listen to what you're speaking to them about today and do that, and that they would um, they'd be pleased to listen to you and that you'd be satisfied with their response. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing one verse of a song. 318 318 <clears throat> Let's just sing the first verse I need thee every hour most gracious Tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. All right, Brother John Rodriguez, you dismiss us from our prayer.